I guess we're uh, at that time. So thanks again for being with us today. I'm Mike Goucher, and welcome to our continuing series of conversations that we call On the Issues, where we sit down and talk with news and policymakers and people who are making a difference in our uh, community, our region, and even beyond. Uh, today we are joined by uh, Justice Pat Rogensack, who is seated right here, and Milwaukee County Circuit Court Judge Ellen Brostrom. Please give them a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. And before we get any further, we'd also like to recognize another member of the Supreme Court, Justice Annette Ziegler, is with us today. So thanks for joining us. Uh, just a bit of history on both of our guests before we begin our conversation. Uh, Justice Pat Rogensack was elected to the Supreme Court back in 2003. Before that, she was on the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, also a number of years in private practice. Um, she graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School. And uh, Judge Brostrom uh, is a graduate of UCLA Law School. She was elected to office, Milwaukee County Circuit Court Judge, uh, a seat that was open uh, back in uh, the fall, I mean the spring of last year. Right. Not very long ago at all. Right. Yeah. And uh, before that, she was a partner at uh, Reinhardt Berner Van Duren, and also has worked in the DA's office, uh, done a number of interesting things in her life, which we will talk about. Um, by now, I guess you can tell they are mother and daughter. There's just a, just a very vague resemblance here. Um, and, uh, but they are not just any mother and daughter. Uh, as we have pointed out in, in promoting this event, they are the only mother and daughter that, that we know of uh, to serve on the bench at the same time in the state of Wisconsin's history. Um, so it is kind of an interesting moment here. And I'm wondering, as you were running for office last spring, if you were aware of that fact, and no. Did you feel any additional pressure when you found out about it? <laughs> um, actually, I did not realize that until Judge Jean D'Amato on our local circuit court said, have you thought about whether, in fact, this might be true? So, no, I didn't, I didn't uh, think about it while I was running. What do you think of the fact that today we sit here, Justice Rogensack, you graduated with your degree in zoology from Drake University, uh, back in 1962, uh, at that time there were no, that I know of, no women sitting on the bench in Wisconsin. And here we are today, you're sitting on the state's highest court, your daughter's serving in the state's largest municipality. Uh, could you have ever foreseen this day? Well, you know, when I went to law school, uh, I never thought about being a judge. And when I went into practice, I never thought about being a judge. So certainly, no, I, I didn't think about it at all. Uh, I, when I ran for the Court of Appeals, uh, actually, I ran for the Supreme Court first, and I lost. I don't know if you all know that, but, but I did, and then uh, ran for the Court of Appeals the next year and was elected. And when I ran for the Supreme Court, I really ran on a dare, if you can believe. I called up a friend in La Crosse, and I was trying to get him interested in helping me get another guy to run for the seat that was going to be available because Justice Heffernan was retiring, and that's the seat that Justice Bradley now has. And he was getting ready for trial. And he said, well, you just quit bugging me. You're always so interested in judges. Why don't you run yourself? And I thought, well, maybe I will. Well, I knew nothing about it. And then, of course, to start out at a statewide campaign shows how little I knew about politics. But anyway, it was a good learning experience. But I certainly never would have foreseen uh, a mother-daughter combination, that's for sure. Well, I want to go back, uh, and we'll, we'll go back into the to the past here for a moment and, and talk about, first we'll talk with you, Justice, Justice Rogan Sack, about your decision to go to law school, which uh, came a, a fair amount of years after uh, you graduated from Drake University. And then I want to get your perspective on, on her decision, how it affected you, how it's influenced uh, your uh, choices in life. Um, you went back in, in 1977? 1977. So this right. is 15 years after you graduated from Drake yep. University. Mm -hmm. um, why law school at that moment? Well, you had three kids, I should point out. Yes, that's right. I did have three children. Um, well, when I graduated from undergraduate school, I had an opportunity for a fellowship in genetics to get a master's degree. But my husband was in medical school, and so I drew the go-to-work straw. And, you know, it never occurred to Jeff or I that we should borrow the money and we should both stay in school. I mean, he was closer to being done with his full education than I was, so I went to work and he finished school. And then when he got done... I went to school. Um, so, you know, it was to go to law school was a change and a thought that occurred to me during the intervening years. Basically, the money for research had dried up by that time. If you didn't have a name, you couldn't easily get research money. And although I love the people I worked for and the projects I worked on, 
the most fun in scientific research is trying to proceed on your own ideas and your own thoughts. And if you can't get the money for the grants to run a lab, you really can't do much of that. Um, and someplace along the line, I became interested in the law. We had a number of friends when we lived in St. Louis where my husband was a, a resident who were lawyers, and it seemed like they did very interesting things. Um, and when we moved to Madison, um, Matthew, our son, was only six weeks home, six weeks old. So I was a stay-at-home mom for a while. But then I was thinking about going back to school. So when Matthew was in first grade, I took a class in inferential statistics and in constitutional law. And the statistics course was because if I didn't like the constitutional law course, I would apply to graduate school in the science, and my statistics were way out of date. And you can't do any kind of scientific research without good statistics. Mm -hmm. Well, I liked the statistics course, but I loved the constitutional law course from David Adamani. It wasn't taught through the law school. It was taught through the political science department. But um, Professor Adamani had a law degree from Harvard, even though he was chairman then of the Department of Political Science at uh, University of Wisconsin. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so I went to law school then the next year. So you were 10 years old at the time. Right. Uh, what do you remember of those days? Uh, you were telling me some fascinating yeah. stories about when you were a young girl. Well, I, a number of things. One, um, it's remarkable how little affected I really felt. Um, part of it is my mom is genetically blessed with the need to sleep very little. Uh, I did not get that gene. Um, <laughs> But um, so that helped. Um, but I can remember being at you know rehearsals for Children's Theater of Madison and my mom you know studying in the back of the room and um, I vividly remember uh, exam weeks when she would lock herself in her study literally for a week and it's really the only time that she exited um, her normal role, if you will, um, which is probably why it made such an impression on me. And I can remember during one of the exam weeks having something I wanted to talk with her about. And going to her and saying, Mom, can I talk with you? And her saying, well, yes, if it's important, you can. But if it could wait, you know, that would be preferable. And I had not a shred, not, not a shred of hesitation in believing that if in my 11-year-old judgment I decided this had to be discussed, she would stop what she was doing and she would discuss it. Now, my recollection is, I hope it's yours as well, that I decided I didn't need to speak with her um, at that time. So that, that was my experience of her in law school. And then, you know, as I've developed, uh, uh, you know, through college and into adulthood, you know, she's been an incredible role model for me um, in ways that I probably can't really even begin to appreciate. But neither of my parents, uh, they, they were both very gender neutral. So we were always told we could do whatever we wanted to do educationally, professionally, and conversely, both sisters and brothers of my siblings, we all learned to cook, we all learned to clean. My brother's a great cook. Um, so there was, of course, them telling me I could do whatever I wanted to do and making those opportunities available and encouraging me and all the things that parents do. But there was also just the role model aspect of seeing her do what she's done. 